So welcome everybody to this week's Oxford Discrete Maths and Probability Seminar. Um, so as usual, if you would like to ask questions, please ask them in the chat um, and Alex or I will um, unmute if necessary or um, ask questions ourselves or potentially take them at the end if that seems like a more sensible thing to do. Um, it's a huge pleasure to have Robin Stevenson here who's going to speak to us about critical random directed graphs. Robin, over to you. Thank you very much, Christina, for the introduction. Let me share my screen. There we go. All right, so as you can see, this is actually joint work with Christina, which uh, we did while I was a postdoc at Oxford. And the uh, funny thing is, so when I left, I was wondering, I hope I can come back soon, present these results at the seminar. I ended up doing this, I guess, in a virtual format. That's also very fine. So as you can see, the topic is about scaling limits. So that's something that uh, people in probability are quite familiar with. The first example we may have in mind is, let's say, that a rescaled random walk, in most cases, converges to, say, Brownian motion or Levy process. And you know, since this basic result, there's been many things and uh, in particular, nowadays, we like to make random graphs converge to rather complicated objects. This started, you could say, maybe with uh, David Aldous in the, in the early 90s, who made, who rescaled some random trees to, towards those complicated objects we call continuum random trees. And there's many more things, things like maps, which are decorated graphs to converge to other complicated metric spaces. And with Christina, we were interested in a slightly different kind of random graph, a directed graph. So this is slightly unusual since uh, directed graphs don't naturally fit with uh, the techniques, the, well, the Grom of Hausdorff way we use of making graphs converge, of making yeah, graphs converge to metric spaces. But it turns out that we end up with a rather simple structure and things work very well as we will see later on. The first thing you have to do before we talk about our results is, of course, introduce this random directed graph that we're going to talk about. I'm going to call it GNP here, and I have a Zoom thing annoying me in the, there you go, sorry. So I call it GNP. And so it's going to be a random directed graph. It could be equal to this thing. We're going to come back to this drawing very soon for now. So GNP is directed graphs. It has a set of vertices and a set of edges. So as is very common, set of vertices is just the first n integers. And the edges are where the randomness will be. And we do something which is reasonably standard, but in this directed graph world. So the complete directed graph would have n times n minus 1 directed edges, one for each ordered pair. And we take each of those independently with probability p. So we do some kind of percolation, erase a few of them, and keep the others. And so we might end up with something like that. So the probability of landing on this one, here n is equal to 17, you know, would be p times the, the number of edges we have times 1 minus p to the power of the edges that we don't have. So that defines a random graph. And so it should remind you of the erdos rheny graph. It's kind of the similar idea, except for directed graphs. And similarly, again, we're interested in its connectivity properties, specifically the connected components. And for directed graphs, we need a more precise notion of connectivity, which is what we call strong connectiveness. Connectivity. So we're looking at strongly connected components. I'm going to call those SCC. It's a fairly common abbreviation. So what, what does strong mean here? Well, two vertices x and y are going to be in the same strongly connected component if I can go from one to the other in both directions. So there's a path from x to y and a path from y to x. Let's go back to our picture and let's figure out what the connected components, strongly connected components of this graph are. So for example, one and two. You can see that I can go from one to two because there's a path with five in the middle. I can go from two to one because there's this path with 17 in the middle. So this means that one and two are in the same strongly connected component. 
In fact, better than that, we've created this cycle, 1, 5, 2, 17. So we already know that these four vertices are in the same strongly connected components. However, I can't leave that set. There's no arrow which points out of 1, 5, 2, or 17. So this makes this thing, actually, this is one of the SCCs of my graph. Similarly, we have 7, 11. That's a tiny cycle. You can go from one to the other directly. And I can leave this set. Right? There's lots of arrows pointing out of them. But I can't come back in. So again, this set is a component, 7, 11. Then if you go forward, you'll see that 15 is alone because we can't leave. 10 is also alone because we can leave, but we land in, in 15, so then we get stuck. Then there's a rather large component with 3, 8, 9, 16, 14, and 6. You see what happens. The reason this is a strong connecting component, we can go kind of we can go to 14 from kind of anyone, and then from 14, we can go to 6 and to 3, closing all the cycles you'd want. After that, everyone is actually alone, because uh, you, you'll see at 12, you can, you can leave 12, but you can only go to 2 or 4. You can't leave 4, so 4 is alone, and that makes 12 is alone. 13 is also alone, because if you leave, you land at 4 again. So that's how you look at the strongly connected components of a random graph. Now, these strongly connected components have a phase transition, which is very much the same as the phase transition of the erdos schrenner graph, if you've heard of this. So to do that, I take p, my probability parameter, to be a constant over n. So take c to be basically any number. And something very interesting happens depending on whether C is larger or smaller than one. So if C is larger than one, we end in what we would call a supercritical regime. And it happens that there's a giant component. So that more or less the same meaning as for the other Schrinny graph. So you have a strongly connected component which has a linear proportion of vertices and all the other ones are very small. <coughs> Meanwhile, if C is smaller than one, then all the components will end up being small. And here, I think small actually means uh, that their sizes are all bigger of one in probability. So it's really quite small. So this is something which has been known for a while. And reasonably recently, something more precise was obtained by Wuchak and Zayerstadt, so 10 and a bit years ago, and which showed that we were, go were going to have what we call a critical window. So what they did is they put the cells in this critical regime-ish, take P is one over N, but you're allowed a little bit of wiggle room. So your wiggle room, as you can see, is a, a number divided by N to the power of four thirds. And this number lambda N is taken to be a little O of N to the power of one third. So this is chosen so that P is still equivalent to one over N. So somehow we're still in the critical phase almost. And interesting things happen if lambda n tends to plus or minus infinity. So if lambda n tends to plus infinity, then we're going to be in a way quasi supercritical. So the largest strongly connected component, it's not going to be giant with a linear proportion of vertices, but quite close. So its number of vertices is n to the power one third times lambda n squared. And it's much larger than the second largest. The second largest will have a order a big O of that thing divided by a lambda n cubed. So we had a lambda n squared at the bottom at the top, and now we just have a lambda n at the bottom. <laughs> so that's the almost supercritical phase. Meanwhile, we have an almost subcritical phase if lambda n tends to minus infinity. Then all the strongly connected components are rather small. And the largest is the same thing we had before. So bigger of n to the power one third divided by lambda n. Now you need an absolute value because lambda n is negative. So this is a very nice result. But of course, you look at this and you ask yourself, well, what happens in the middle? So what happens if lambda n stays bounded? Or might as well directly say, what happens if it converges? So in their paper, Wuchak and Zayerstadt had some partial results for these cases, but they were very much incomplete. And so Christina and I decided to try and figure out 
what happens in more detail. But before I tell you about any of this, you're going to need to take a step back and look at what happens for the erdos rheny graph. So I'm going to forget about directed graphs slightly and just tell you some uh, well-known results in the case of the undirected case in kind of this situation where the lambda n converges. So this means that I take my p to be 1 over n plus lambda n divided by n to power 4 third, where the lambda n converges. So we kind of move things around until there's a constant lambda here, and then there's an extra bit, which is negligible. And so this constant, of course, lambda can be really any real number. And I'm never actually going to talk about lambda again, but you should know that it matters and it's used to define some of the random objects which uh, will appear later. But it's not, you don't need to think about it actively in terms of understanding what's happened. So in, uh, in this world, I'm going to give you two theorems which have been proven in the past. The first one is by David Aldous, so 1997. So we look at the connected components of GNP, the erdos rheny graph, which I should have said, we should make, it, make this clear. It's defined the same way as I defined the GNP arrow, except now there's no arrows. So out of the n times n minus one of the two edges, we pick all of them independently of probability p. And we can't look at strongly connected components anymore. We just look at connected components. And I'm going to call their sizes Z1, Z2, Z3, and so on, and order them in decreasing order to make things clear and well-defined. And then it turns out that these sizes of components, they are of order n to the power two thirds. This means that if I divide them all by n to the power two thirds, then they converge in distribution to certain number, certain random numbers, sigma i. And in fact, this is a rather strong convergence. David always proved that it's a convergence of sequences. So not just Zin divided by n to the power two thirds converges to sigma i, but the whole sequence of the rescaled Zins converges to the sequence of the sigma i's in, in uh, L2 in distribution. So what you should remember from this is that Zin is of order n to the power two thirds. That's one theorem. And the next more recent one is by <coughs> Luigi Adario Berry, Nicolas Broutin, and Christina, is, uh, tells us what happens to the actual connected components and not just their sizes. So I'm going to call my, my connected components CIN, indexed by I. And of course, I reorder them in a way which matches the ordering of the sizes, which I had earlier. And then it turns out that if I rescale CIN by n to the power one third, not two thirds, one third this time, then it converges in distribution to a thing I call CI. So if you haven't seen this before, this may look a bit strange. How does, so CIN, that's a connected component of a graph. It's a graph. How do you rescale a graph and make it converge to CI? Well, we use this thing called gromov hausdorff topology, which isn't something I want to talk a lot about, but it's a way of making metric spaces converge to other metric spaces. So what you do is consider your CIN, so it's a graph, but we could also say that it's a metric space by saying that each edge is actually a line segment, line segment with length one. And then we rescale all the lengths by n to the power one third. And this random metric space converges to a random metric space CI. And the gromov hausdorff topology tells you that two metric spaces are close if very informally you can kind of superimpose them. So draw one and the other kind of on top of each other with very few mistakes. That's a bit fuzzy, but that's really more than enough to understand what's going on. <clears throat> And again, it's actually a convergence of sequences with a, with a more, more precise topology I don't need to talk about here. Okay, so this may seem a bit weird and abstract, but what I want you to remember, the main takeaway from this, is that the typical distance between two points inside CIN 
is of order this power then into the power one third. And that's why we have to divide by into the power one third to get this interesting limit at the end. And uh, one more thing I'd like to say about this before we go back to directed graphs as a, an extra side note. These connected components and their limits, CINs or CIs, you can basically see them as binary trees with a few additional edges. So forgive me for being slightly unclear, but basically they're gonna look like something like this. So draw a binary tree and then add a few edges. Maybe say I have an edge here and an edge here and maybe one here. So in, uh, in the case of the continuum limit, so in the case of CI here, this would be really a um, continuum tree. So not just finite binary trees, there would be edges everywhere. And the whole thing would be a very dense structure. And these extra edges would really be identification. So you would see them as edges with length zero. More on that later, actually. But all right, so that's a recap of things which have been done in the past. Now I can actually talk about uh, the results we developed with Christina. So let me present our results. First, keep this in mind. We're always still in this uh, critical window. And here's an informal description of what happens in the strongly connected components of GNP. <coughs> Three things I want to say. The first thing, could seem a bit surprising. So each strongly connected component is a directed graph. And inside those, they are with high probability, no vertices with degree at least four. So this is a very strong statement really, because in a, in a strongly connected directed graph, you wouldn't have any vertices with degree zero or one because degree zero, because you need to be able to leave any vertex and come back to it, except in very trivial cases. So by excluding all the degrees larger than four, we're stuck with two and three as the only possibilities for the degree of a vertex. And this is a good point to say that degree here means total degree. So number of in and out neighbors, well, out edges. So knowing this, we only need to know what happens to vertices with degree three and two. And it turns out that the number of vertices with degree equal to three is of constant order, keeping this still not quite precise yet, but you should think you know, basically this is bounded or converges. Meanwhile, the number of vertices with degree two is of a large order, of order n to the power one third. So there's going to be lots of vertices of degree two and very few vertices of degree three. Now, what happens when we have all this? Let me draw you a picture and you're going, you will see what happens. So here I've drawn three vertices, which could consider those the big vertices, the vertices of degree three. Those are connected by paths which only have vertices of degree two. So we're going to have something like that. And one more, there you go. And for things to make sense connectivity-wise, we need to have arrows going these ways. And the thing we said is that the number of vertices with degree two is of order n to the power one third, which means that let's say there's around a number little a times n to the power one third of those small vertices along the path. And we're going to do this for all the other paths as well. So maybe this goes down. Maybe this also goes down. This has to go to the left. I'm going to make this faster. And let's say for this one, we have one which goes up. And one which goes down. And each of those paths have a number of vertices which are of order n to the power one third. Now, when you look at this, you might start thinking, well, 
those small vertices with degree two, they're not very interesting. They don't contribute to the actual structure of this graph. The only thing which matters is the number of them on each path. And so we have this idea of basically removing all those little vertices and instead replacing them by a single edge, which goes the same way, but we keep a notion of length for this edge. So this edge has length equal to number of vertices which we had on this path and we erased plus one, I guess. So plus one is negligible. This thing has an edge, uh, this thing has a length which is still of order a times n to the power one third. And we can do this everywhere. So it can basically erase all of those and replace them by simple edges which have very high lengths. So we've got this, we've got that, we've got this, and, and now a theorem also almost pops up. What is the result? The result is rescale by dividing all the distances by n to the power one third. And then we have a limit. And the limit would be you know, this kind of graph I drew with lengths. And so this is what we're interested with in. And really you look at this and you're noticing we just introduced a new structure. Because what I drew here, this is not a graph anymore, not a directed graph, it's a multi-graph because we are allowed to have copies of the same edge. See, we have two edges which go from this vertex to that one. And of course, this is also new. Now all these edges have actual lengths assigned to them. So this would be a length, an edge with length A and that an, an edge with length B. So before I can state our theorem, I need to talk a little bit about this new structure that we've introduced. And we're gonna call them metric directed multigraphs. So multigraphs, we've seen as copies of edges, directed because they have arrows and metric because they have lengths so each edge has a length and call those MDM for short. So let's make this a little bit formal. So I'm gonna call squiggly G with an arrow. That's the set of MDMs, the set of finite multigraphs where each edge has a direction and a length. And I'm going to define a notion of isomorphism between two metric directed multigraphs. So you need to think a little bit and have a good definition of isomorphism. Here I'm going to take not a bijection, but a pair of two bijections, one of them for the vertices and one of them for the edges. And these two things together define an isomorphism from X to Y if they preserve the structure. So you can guess what this means. It means edges, which link uh, to vertices needs to be matched with two, needs to be mapped to edges, which link the images of the vertices. And so this notion of isomorphism completely forgets about the metric structure. It's just about combinatorics. We forget about the lengths for a little while, but it's quite important. And it's important enough that I'm gonna make you work a little bit and figure out how many isomorphisms we have in three examples. So it's not too tricky, but let's say we have these two metric directed multigraphs. How many isomorphisms do I have from that one to that one? So I guess we can use chat or Christina can say something. <laughs> or I'll just say it myself. Anyone has an idea? It's not a trick. Oh, should look at chat. Uh, Ian is right, zero. Very good. Uh, next. So again, here are two metric directed multigraphs. You can see they're the same. I just uh, had fun and drew them in different order. How many isomorphisms do I have? One, correct, Dan and Ian. So the reason there's one is that so your isomorphism would need to match 
uh, degree properties. So for example, this vertex only has one edge and it's going out, so it needs to be matched to that one and so on. That vertex needs to be matched to that one and that one to that one. And then the edges, well, this edge needs to be mapped to that edge, no choice. Final example, this one. So this time I drew clearly the same graph. How many isomorphism? Two, so fast. Very good. So the reason there's two is that for the vertices, you don't have a choice. This one gets mapped to that one, and this one gets mapped to that one. However, for the edges, I could have two possible mappings. So I could have, let's say, the identity in terms of drawings. So the left edge towards the left edge, but I could also do the opposite, map the left edge to the right edge and the right edge to the left edge. So yeah, you can define isomorphisms and indeed there can be multiple isomorphisms inside the same graph. Now, why are we interested in this? We're interested in this to define the distance between two metric directed multigraphs. So what I'm going to call DG of X and Y is going to be defined this way. I take the isomorphism FG, which minimizes this quantity for each edge, I take the difference between its length in X and the length of its image in Y and add this up for all the edges. And if I take the best isomorphism I can find, hopefully this is going to be rather small. Why is this defined like this? This will all become very clear when you look at this example. So here I have not quite the same example as before, but almost. I have uh, two vertices connected by two edges in the same direction. Here I have lengths one and two. Here I have lengths one plus epsilon and two plus epsilon prime. So the distance between these two graphs is epsilon plus epsilon prime. Because we are smart and choose and match you know, this length with that one and that length with this one. If we did it the other way, it would be basically two plus or minus some epsilons. And this is how we say that two metric directed multigraphs are close. And so we define a metric. Now this metric, it has the property that it's very, very rigid. By which I mean some things that maybe we would like for them to be close end up not being close at all. And so this, it might be, we might not be able to prove really good results for this metric. And so here's a good example. I take a very simple graph, which is just a loop. So there's one vertex and it connects to itself <coughs> with the length one. And then I have another graph, which is I add a little bit with length epsilon on the side. So with our metric, these two things are not isomorphic. So the distance is infinity. But if we were looking at other metrics, such as gromov hausdorff metrics, then the distance would be epsilon. So in a way, this seems to be a weakness of this metric, but turns out it won't be, and we will be able to prove results for this metric. Otherwise, I wouldn't spend so much time talking about it. And indeed, I can now state our main theorem. So remember what happened. I have my strongly connected components of my GNP. And I did this interesting thing where I removed all the degree two vertices and replaced them by long edges. And thus that creates a metric directed multigraph for each strongly connected component. And then I rescale that thing by n to the power one third. And I take them as a sequence. And this whole thing converges in distribution. If my notation was consistent, there would be a bracket here. And this converges to some limiting objects, which I'm going to call CI. And so the CI, there's a, there's a sequence C. I guess I should have said they are ordered by decreasing sizes once again. But anyway, we get this sequence C at the end, which is, so that's a sequence of metric directed multigraphs, which are strongly connected. And there's some interesting properties we can say. And the main one, is that, so it's an infinite sequence, no worries. 
But finitely many of these terms are three regular graphs, the graphs where everyone has degree three, that's what we're expecting. Why did I say finitely? Well, turns out the rest are kind of uh, slightly simpler things where <clears throat> there's only one vertex which cycles onto itself. So we're gonna call those cycles. And really, so a vertex doesn't really matter. It could be anywhere, but yeah, this is, so everyone is at either a three regular multigraph or just a simple cycle. And uh, we need a topology for sequences. I said this converges as a sequence. Turns out we can use this one. So the distance between two sequences, A and B, is just the sum of the distances between each AI and BI. So this, again, turns out to be a very, very strong mode of convergence, but it works out fine. And that's our theorem. <coughs> Would be a great time for a question break if anyone has questions. Otherwise, I'm gonna start and talk about how we actually prove this. So for this convergence, you're allowed it diverging to infinity, I guess, or, or is this always actually converge? It, everything converges. In particular, these sums are all finite for our thing. Well, for, for what we're looking at, these sums are finite. So no worries. All right. So is this distance in any way to be compared with all this is L2? So it's... Looks like L1. So this is an L1 thing, right, right. So... We're, we're not direct, we're not talking about the sizes of the components here, technically, but uh, I'm not sure. Probably there is an L1 convergence of the sizes as well. Uh, that's something we could check actually, but yeah. Uh, it's more comparable to a thing I didn't say, is that in the undirected case, there were the, the gromov hausdorff convergence of the components is L4. And this, this, is, uh, this is the actual closest thing. I saw something in chat, which may be worth. No, okay. All right, so let's move on. And to understand how these things work, it's quite common nowadays to use exploration techniques to explore random graphs and see what happens. And here I'm going to present a version of a, a depth first search, which is going to be very good for our directed graphs. So depth first search is, is that me? It's probably me, sorry. A depth first search is a way of creating structure in your graph and seeing it as First, a spanning forest to which we've uh, attached a few additional edges, which give your full graph structure. So this exploration, I'm going to build by hand a spanning forest of this graph. It looks complicated, but it's going to be fine. And then this is going to actually give us a proper structure of the graph and will let us find some interesting properties. So here I'm going to do something crazy and zoom out a little bit. And let's, let's draw. I will directly show you how we do the exploration. So first thing I do is take the smallest available vertex, which is one. And I list its out neighbors. So its out neighbors, if you look, of course, we have five and, seven and 17. So I'm going to put five and 17. But I put them from left to right in increasing order. So in, the, in my original graph, 5 and 17 were to the left and right. That had no meaning because this was just a graph. Here, I'm going to say planar order is important, and 5 is to the left of 17. And I put my edges between them. I, I don't need the arrows because all the edges I'm going to draw will naturally point upwards. Now, having done that, I can say that I've explored one. So thank you very much, Mr. One. Your turn is done. Now I have two available vertices, five and 17. I'm going to explore the leftmost one. So that's five. And by explore, I mean list the out neighbors. So five has only one out neighbor, that's two. 
Okay, very good. Now two has been explored. Uh, sorry, now five has been explored. So five is done. And we can now, we have now two available vertices, two and 17. Let's explore the leftmost one. That's two. Two has an out neighbor, right? 17. Wait, 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 we can't do that. That's because 17 is already here. So we're going to mark this out edge from 2 to 17 in red, not arbitrarily at all. So that's well and good. Two is done. Now we only have one vertex available. That's 17. Let's explore 17. 17 has one out edge, which is one. Again, I'm not allowed to do that because one is already on my tree. So instead, I'm going to draw an edge from 17 to one in green. So why, well, we don't really need this. Sorry. Why was that one green and the other one red? <clears throat> so the difference is that when I was exploring two, I uncovered this edge from two to 17. 17 was already discovered, but it wasn't explored yet. So any edge which goes from a vertex to a vertex which was already discovered but not explored becomes red. However, when I was exploring 17 and uncovered this edge going to one, one was already completely explored. So we're going to mark this as green. And now we're going to keep doing this. So having explored 17, we've kind of run out of things we can explore. So we take the smallest vertex, which hasn't been looked at yet in the graph. That's three. Let's do it here. So three has out neighbors eight, 10, and 15. I should have zoomed out more. We'll, we'll see how this goes. OK, let me use my skills to make this work better, like that. So we got 8, 10, 15. We explore them kind of left to right. So 8 goes to 6, 9, and 16. There we go. Then 6. So you can see 6 goes to 12 and 3. So 3 has already been explored. So we get a green edge here. And 12 is new. So we get this. Then we explore 12. 12 has this going to 2. 2 has already been explored. And it also goes to 4. 4 is new. Now we explore 4. With 4 has no out neighbors. So we're done. Next is 9. 9 goes to 14, which is new. And that's it. 14 has two green edges from 6 to 4. And it also has a blue edge to the new 13. 13 has that. And I will start talking less because I think you can see where this is going. 16 just has this. And 10 goes to 15. That's red. And that's all. And then we have 711. So which is just this. So one blue and one green. So I've drawn a spanning edge. Uh, 11 also goes to 5. I always forget that one. So I've drawn the spanning forest of my graph. And all the edges which were not on the spanning forest, I've marked them as green or red. So I've also done some kind of classification of all my edges into two interesting, well, three interesting types. Let's look at this into more detail. Zoom back in a little bit. Uh, sorry, let's make this work. Should be good. So three kinds of edges. The blue ones are what we could call the natural tree edges, which went to new out neighbors. And the red ones are what we call surplus edges. So they are edges which went to vertices. Their targets were already seen, but not explored. And what you notice is that both of those kinds of edges go forward. And by forward, I mean they go forward in the planar order of this forest I've drawn. So the planar order is the depth first order. So like 1, then 5, then 2, then 17. So 17 comes in after 2. So again, this is red. Or here we got 3, 8, 6, blah, 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 blah. 
9, 14, 16, 10, 15. 15 is after 10, so this edge is red. And meanwhile, there's the fourth kind of edges. So the green edges go from any vertex to a vertex which had already been fully explored beforehand. And those all go backward in, again, this sense of uh, the depth first order. So set one comes before 17. So this is what a edge which goes backward. Three was before six. So again, this is green. And very imaginatively, we call those back edges. And so we got three kinds of edges. And what's interesting is that there is an order on the tree for which two kinds go forward and one kind go backward. So naturally, if we want to create cycles and strongly connecting components, we need to mix up the forward and the backward. It's the interaction between the forward and the backward which creates the strongly connecting components. For example, if I go back again in this thing, uh, well, very simply, for example, I can go from one to five to two to 17. This is all forward. But if I want to complete the cycle, I need a bit of back at the end. Or I can go from three to eight to 14. That's great. But if I want to go back to three, I need to go back in the backward sense of a back edge of a back edge. And so here now we see really what's going on. Is that we have these kinds of different kind of edges which interact interestingly and kind of naturally. If we want to understand what happens in the limit, we need to understand what happens to each kind of edge in the limit. And it turns out this works very well. And the first res result towards this, which is really interesting, is we're going to look only at the forward part, so the forest, the surplus. And there's this wonderful little proposition. Forget all the green edges, the back edges, and look at only the graph which has the forward edges. And also forget the arrows. So this result is this is just not a directed graph, but just a random graph now. And it turns out it has the same distribution as GNP, the Erdős Rényi graph. Why is that? That's because this exploration process that I just demonstrated has the same distribution as the slightly more classical exploration process of GNP. At every step, the distribution is the same. So the result is the same. In particular, the whole graph is also the same. And from this information, we directly deduce that, well, we can directly apply all those theorems I told you uh, 30 minutes ago done by other people. So in particular, yeah, we know, now know a lot of things, in particular, the number of vertices in each tree of my uh, exploration process is n to the power two thirds. And typical distances inside a tree are of order n to the power one third. So this is great, especially the one third, of course, because that is the scaling factor we are after. So this is already a ton of information. We can even go a little bit further, is that surplus edges, the red edges, there's not many of them. They're bigger of one, basically. So remember I told you a bit earlier that uh, the trees were basically binary trees with a few extra edges. Yeah, that's what I meant by a few extra edges. It's those surplus edges, and there's not too many of them. And it turns out there's so few of them that in the end, they don't count at all. What do I mean by don't count? I mean they are not going to contribute to my strongly connected components. And so we have this proposition. The probability that any SCC of GNP has a surplus edge tends to zero. So that's a rather strong thing. It tells us that we are basically, we will be allowed to ignore anything red after we're done proving that. And it will give you a very informal proof so that maybe you can get an idea of what happens. So this very informal proof starts with a drawing of what happens kind of typically for a surplus edge. So a typical surplus edge, it looks something like this. It, I mean, it has uh, a source point, and it goes, of course, to the target, but the target is related to the source point by this interesting mechanism. First, you go down and look for an ancestor. Now, that ancestor in the tree sense would have 
a few children, naturally. And the target of the surplus edge has to be one of the children of this ancestor, which is on the right side of what we drew. So typically, we don't care at all about those. And we would have one or two vertices here, and then the surplus edge points here. That's, that's how it goes. And now we're interested in the probability that this surplus edge is actually part of a strongly connected component. So how would this be part of a strongly connected component? So for this to happen, it would mean that from here, we are able to link back into our original vertex here. How would this happen? Well, look at this. This is the tree of descendants of this vertex. So, I mean, I could draw it as a tree, but let's just say it's a, it's a blob. And we know that, of course, we have a tree structure inside. If we ever want to loop back towards this wonderful person, then we would need a green edge to go out, hopefully. And, you know, maybe that green edge would go here. That would be perfect. Well, that's not necessarily the only thing which could happen. We could have a red edge going out of here as well. And stuff would happen. And eventually, that red edge would lead to a green edge, which again points somewhere here. So, for my original red edge here to count as part of a strongly component, we need a green or red edge to leave from here. So, this probability is smaller than the probability of having this or that. And I should mention that these, that one of these things exists and links inside the same tree, of course. Otherwise, this wouldn't work. Now, here's the interesting bit. It turns out that the size of this tree is rather small. So, we can write this as smaller than p times n to the power two thirds. And this is going to be very approximate. So let's put uh, this smaller than p times n to the power two thirds. Because so p is the probability of for any edge to exist. n to the power two thirds is the number of possible targets for this green or red edge, because it's the number of people in the same tree times let's say the expectation of the number of vertices inside that subtree. Because you know, this green or red edge needs to leave from somewhere. And this is not an eight, it's this subtree. I, thought, I hope that's okay. And it turns out that this subtree is pretty small. The reason for that is uh, that this, Everything we're doing is happening inside a tree of my spanning forest. And the trees of my spanning forest, they're quite related to Galton Watson trees. They're not really Galton Watson trees, but they're related enough for us to say that this is basically on the spine of that tree, and this is basically off the spine. And we know that everything which is off the spine is rather small. In particular, it's basically big O of one. So this is a big O of one. So I'm going to have smaller than in the unclear sense. So P, P is basically one over N times N to the power two thirds. That tends to zero. So what I've done more or less is say for every red edge, the probability that it contributes to a strongly connected component tends to zero. There's a finite number of red edges so add a finite number of zeros and we get zero. That's an informal proof of this proposition. So this is very good. We're now saying that we can only, we only need to look at the tree of blue and the back edges of green. And hopefully these things combine properly in the limit to give us what we want. So now we only need to actually look at the back edges. So let's see what happens. Limit of the back edges. And the first thing I'm going to show you is that there seems to be a problem at first glance. So take a single tree from your exploration forest. Let's say it has k vertices. If it has k vertices, 
then the possible amount of back edges is k times k minus one over two, because every pair has uh, an earlier and a later vertex. And each of those appear independently with probability p. p is about one over n. But I said that k is about n to the power two thirds. So here's the weird thing which happens. The expected number of back edges will be you know, of order p times k squared, p times k squared becomes that. That's a positive power of n. That tends to infinity. That is strange. Remember, we said we, we were ending with graphs which are basically finite. So we're not happy to have an infinite number of edges, even an expectation that's weird. But each problem has a solution, hopefully. And this one has, in any case, and it turns out that most of the back edges don't actually matter in the same sense as before. They actually won't contribute to a strongly connected component. So I don't have much space, but let me draw you a picture so that you can see why this happens. Uh, so here's a very simple binary tree. Here's a back edge inside this tree. It goes from right to left. And this doesn't create a strongly connected component. There are no cycles in there, right? However, so, so by which I mean, so if we were just looking at strongly connected components, we could erase that one, ignore it completely, and that would be fine. So that shows why some of the back edges don't matter. And so here's a question. How do we find, find those which actually do matter and select them? Well, look at this back edge here. I wouldn't go to the root. Let's go back slightly. This one. So this is what I call an ancestral back edge because it goes from a vertex to a parent of that vertex inside the tree. This immediately produces a cycle. And so a cycle becomes a strongly connected component because I can go around this and it can go from any point to any point of this thing. And uh, this is a uh, fundamental category of back edges, which are part of strongly connected components. But what would happen if I had an ancestral back edge, which looked something like that? Now, what happens here is that, so we have this cycle along this, but now all of a sudden this back edge actually counts and is part of a strongly connected component. Because you know, from here, I can reach this, and then I can cycle like that. So having this preliminary strongly, well, part of a strongly connected component enabled this back edge, which was useless before, to become actually useful. And this is how we're going to select all the back edges, which actually matter. So there's a simple algorithm. First, you go around the tree in the depth first order. So, you know, like this, that was clear. <laughs> and while going around, you're going to throw away all the back edges you see until you reach the first ancestral one. That one you keep because you know it's part of a strongly connected component. And after that, you will keep all the back edges which are either ancestral or which linked into something we've already selected. By this, I mean something like what happened here. I selected this cycle, and then this edge links into that cycle, and that enables it to be part of a strongly connected component. So when you do that, this, is bec this becomes some kind of a selection process on the tree. And it turns out that in the limit, this converges to a Poisson point process on the limiting continuum random tree. And this is what makes everything work at the end. And it works so well that I'll just attempt to draw what happens without, without any plans or preparation. And you will see how this works. So what we end up with is a binary tree. So let me try and draw a reasonably non-boring binary tree. Let's say this one. So you could say either this is a discrete tree with lots of uh, small vertices about n to the power one third of each, or we already been rescaling things and each of these edges has a length. And then we have some back edges. So maybe we have that is a back edge and maybe we have, let's make something slightly interesting. So that's the one we had before. 
And then maybe we have something weird like this. Okay, and I claim that this creates some nice structure. So let's start with the bottom one. So that's just a cycle. So for rather arbitrary reasons, we say that just a cycle has actually a vertex and a vertex of degree two. Now the one on the left, so we can see there's going to be strongly connected components. The way you really see it appear as a metric directed multigraph is you put the vertices at the points which have degree three on what you've drawn. Here, there's two points of degree three. And so let's say we have two vertices. And then you just draw the edges from one to the other. So for example, I have one edge going from here to here. And another one, which goes like this. This is basically one edge as well. So we have two edges, which do the same thing. They have different lengths. Well, they have lengths, which are very likely to be different, and that's it. And then we have a third edge, which goes this way, like that. So basically, that's an edge which goes the other way from the first one. And there you go. This is what sometimes we can call the theta kernel. And then finally, the last one. So the last one's a bit more complicated, but let's see. So I want to draw every point with degree three in my structure. So there's one here and there's one here. Uh, I messed up, right? Because this one is not going to contribute. But if I put it here, then it should. One vertex here and one vertex here. And let's try and make this work. So we got four vertices. And to make it to make things good, let's label them. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And I have naturally an edge going from one to two, and one going from one, two to three. And there's one going from three to one. It kind of loops back like this. And we also have one going from to, uh, did I miss, there's five vertices, right? There's one here as well. No, 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 that one was good. Sorry, that was good. There's one going from two to three, but kind of parallel. No, this is a, this is a vertex. This is a vertex, okay, my bad. We have vertex number five here. So we have one going from two four to four. Four is five. not a vertex, is it? Four, four is not a vertex. Thank you, Matthias. Four is not a vertex because it's not really degree three since the bit on the left doesn't exist. Okay, that's good. That's four. This is the new four. So we have two to four. So like this. And then we have three to one. I drew that. And there's, there's a four to three and a four to one. So there's four to three and a four to one. OK, that's my result. And it's a bit sloppy at the end. But you will notice that, yeah, this is a three regular metric directed multigraph. And so this is what happens. And really, you know, the actual proof is just to see that, yeah, all these lengths are n to the power one third in the discrete world, so they can be rescaled, and we get the things we want in the limit. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. And sorry for going slightly over time. Thank you very much, Robin.